Okay, so the Bible reading today comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, obviously in Paul's day, chapter and verse, so we're going to go and start at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. We'll pick up from there, right the way through to uh, the end of chapter 13. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. All the way through to the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13, I think it is. This is the ESV, yours may be slightly different. But read like this. <clears throat> now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the high gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, if I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, if I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. God bless his word. Okay, let's just quickly start the prayer then on that. said, uh, please empower me to speak faithfully and boldly to these people and to myself. Thank you that you are a God who loves to communicate with us. Thank you that you are a God who loves us perfectly well. Help us to hear and know and do, I pray. Amen. Amen. So, <clears throat> unsurprisingly, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are letters written by the Apostle Paul to the early church in, in Corinth. Corinth being a, a busy uh, sea port city with lots of different people coming and going uh, from different cultures. So there's a lot of uh, different ideas and practices going on there. It was a bit of an an eclectic mix in current there, in Greece. Not all of it, as you can imagine, was God-honouring. And sadly, this was also evident in the early church members there, in their attitude, 
in their behaviour, in their kind of twisted understanding of things at that time, thus prompting the Apostle Paul to compose uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians largely as a letter of rebuke and instruction in the, uh, the proper way to behave and do things. Uh, you may be surprised to, to learn that uh, there's actually four letters mentioned. We obviously have one and two Corinthians. They go in your canon, uh, the canon, the, the Bible there, we've got there. Uh, there's two others. Um, we can find evidence of in, first one is in 1 Corinthians 5 9. There's another one in 2 Corinthians 2, 3, and 4. These two other letters have sadly been lost in, in the problems of time. But we do have the, the 1 and 2 Corinthian letters. Good information for you perhaps to store away for the next time you're in a Bible quiz. And the Apostle Paul addresses a number of issues in 1 Corinthians which the early church there in Corinth were sadly struggling with. Things like sexual immorality, the correct way to approach uh, the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, things like um, spiritual gifts and various other things. So this is where we pick up the tail end of chapter 12, which is where Paul is dealing with some confusion over spiritual gifts. If you keep your Bibles open, we're going to skip along through what we just read. Tail end of chapter 12, he's dealing with um, some misunderstanding of some spiritual gifts there. It seems that some members of the church in Corinth were elevating some spiritual gifts over others, thus making some people feel less important, less needed, and their giftings less important, which is uh, not the case. So at the, um, the end of chapter 12, Paul gives uh, the human body analogy, doesn't he? To highlight that fact that everyone is important and equally needed in the church, for the church body to function well. Just like the body needs every part of it to function well. The eye can't say it had no uh, need for hand, however he, he words it earlier on there. The body, we, all, we need all our bits of the body to, to be healthy and function, don't we? And the church is the same, with all the people in it and their giftings. So from chapter 12, 27 and 28, Paul says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. And although each person in the church is equally needed and their giftings are equally valid and needed for the church to function well, there does seem to be a kind of ranking going on here with the giftings. There is a kind of ranking going on um, where the apostles are being mentioned first and then prophets second and then teachers third and then so on. But the emphasis is based on these gifts' ability to build up the church. It's more about the benefit of the church as a whole and building them up than it is about the individual with the gifts, sort of individual rock star status, so to speak. The emphasis is on, is on building others up around us. We have to be aware of the pride which resides in us all. Actually. It's very easy to let ourselves get puffed up and what the giftings we have, isn't it? I think it was Augustine who said, the mother of all sin is pride. It's very true. Spiritual gifts, uh, they're not party tricks. It's not your way into the magic circle. It's not the Paul Daniels magic show. They're not to be used as a means to build up our own self-importance. They're to be used to build up others around you. For the glory of God, not your own glory. Plus the gifts mentioned in verses 28 to 30, they're more 
representative than exhausted in that list. Uh, some sections of chapter 12 mentions various gifts in some parts and then not others. So these lists are representative rather than exhaustive. But the gift of speaking in tongues does appear prominent as chapters 12 and 13 finishes and starts on this subject. This may well be uh, at least one of the gifts which the early church members in Corinth were elevating above others, making a bit too much of this speaking tongues gift. So verse 31, Paul writes, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I'll show you a still more excellent way. There's a few things to point out here. Firstly, it's, it's actually okay for Christians to desire spiritual gifts. It's a good thing. We are all blessed with at least one gift from the Holy Spirit that we can use to bless others with. So it's okay to desire it. The question is, why do you desire it? Like I said, they're not party tricks. They're not to be used for prideful boasting or one-upmanship or pumping yourself up in your self-importance. But if you desire them to enable you to servant-heartedly build others up in the church, that's a great thing. That's a good thing to desire. Whatever giftings you have, it's okay for you to desire them. Not just to remain the same. You may be good at making cracking coffee. That's, that's a relatively new thing over the years you've done at Horan. We've We've ramped up the coffee. We've gone fresh. Um, oh, posh sort of coffee place used to be in the brand. Uh, we, we, we got a load of their um, coffee in and, and, and we made lovely coffee at uh, Horan now. And that's, I really appreciate that. That's a great thing. If you're good at making coffee, if, if, if you're like a, a, a natural barista, God bless you. That's a great thing to have in the church. But it's not just to keep doing that how you've been doing it, it's okay actually for us to, to desire our giftings to increase. To have a greater impact on blessed others around us. You can make great coffee, make better coffee. If you can preach, pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, enable you to preach better. More faithfully, more boldly. So have a greater impact on blessed others. It's a great thing to desire gifts and to have them increase by the Holy Spirit. It's also okay for you to desire gifts which you're not even aware that you have yet. If your desire is to bless others in ways which you don't even know you can yet, it's just a good thing. Test out your giftings. Have a go at making coffee you've never done coffee before. See where your giftings lie. It's a, it's a good thing to desire these things, to bless others with giftings which you don't even know yet. You have yet. Who knows how the Holy Spirit will bless you and enable you and equip you for the works He has before you that you don't even know yet. And that's part of the Holy Spirit's work, isn't it? To, to enable us and equip us. It's a good thing for you to desire all these things, these giftings, and to build them up so that you can. Play your part in building others up around you. It's a godly thing, good thing, if you desire for the right reason. To humbly build others up around you. To be certain hard in that way. That's a good thing. Secondly, uh, where Paul writes higher gifts, Paul's just simply referring to those gifts, like I said, as a greater impact on building others up around. Um, and it's really got the numbers to it's, it's not to elevate one gift above another. It's basically a numbers to For instance, um, personally speaking, I can't really recall experiencing anybody speaking in tongues. I think there was one time I was at a Christian um, evangelistic meeting where someone in the distance was. Having wife, or did he know what to say? Uh, but maybe that was a time or not, I don't know. 
I can't really experience it in a big way. I can't remember experiencing it in a big way. I've not, certainly never done it myself, I don't think. Although Lynette, my wife, says I do talk like the gibberish sometimes. And, I, and I'm not knocking that gift. That's a genuine, bona fide gift of the Spirit. That's a blessing from God, of course. I'm not knocking it or belittling it. But personally speaking, I would imagine if I did experience it or done it myself, it'd probably be a bit of a novelty and a, and, a, and a wonderful blessing from God at the time. I'm not knocking it. It'd be a bit of a novelty at the time, at that time. But compare that gift with um, the gift of hospitality, for instance, then I would argue, in my logic, that over the years that the church has been around, the gift of hospitality has blessed more people than the gift of tongues ever has. You're just an honest thing. I can think, well, I can't recall the amount of times I've been wonderfully blessed by faithful people showing me hospitality. Like I said, I can't call anyone blessing me with tongues or me blessing with anyone else. It's just a number thing. Likewise, the gifts of teaching and preaching has had a far greater uh, impact on blessing the church than hospitality has. Where would the church be without faithful men over the years faithfully and boldly expounding God's word? We wouldn't even be a church, would we? You take the Bible out of the church, you ain't got no church. We can be as hospitable as we like, no one preaching God's word faithfully. All you've really got is a cosy little social club, haven't you? You might as well pack up and go home, unless that's all you want, to be in a social club. Be honest, I'd rather be in a social club with a bar, if that's what we offer. So it's a numbers thing impacting a, a, a great audience, if you like, and blessing them in that way. But we don't want to make the same mistake as the early church in Corinth did and elevate these gifts over others. They're all equal. They're all needed and valid. But undeniably, some gifts have a greater impact on building up the church than others around us. And that's the point, it's just to build others up in a humble and servant hearted way. Thirdly, as chapter 12 flows into chapter 13, Paul speaks of a more excellent way, the way of love. The way of love. That is to say that as great as, as it is to desire gifts and to use them efficiently and well, if your motivation is to use your giftings in love, if your motivation is love, and Paul says, that's far greater. That's far greater. And at the risk of sounding like 80s pop icon Tina Turner, you may ask me, well, what's love got to do with it then? What has love got to do with it? Well, in uh, chapter 13, the Apostle Paul tells us exactly what love is. Spiritual gifts and service, that is. So in verse 1 of chapter 13, Paul starts with the subject which the early church seemed to be making a bit too much of. They kind of get a bit worked up about this tongues business. He starts on that subject. And he says in chapter, uh, verse 1, chapter 13, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, useless. Just what noise. Just banging, clashing, irritating noise. Unless you happen to like that kind of thing. Probably give most people a headache. Bang, 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 clash, clash, clash. Without love, that's all that's going on there. Not my words, of course. Paul goes on, verse 2. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Sadly, 
we probably can remember coming across, most of us can remember coming across someone like this guy. So, yeah. Someone who says they've got the gift of prophecy. You know, and I'm not talking about, I mean, I'm not talking about on the scale of Elijah. I think that thing is kind of shot to see again. Yeah. But, you know, God does give us snippets of info and, and, and insight here and there. I think, I think that's a gift, a genuine gift to help build up their church around us. But so you get some people that have not got the gift of prophecy. And all they really seem to do is just tear the place down with their negativity. They're just fault finders, picking out sin and fault. This is wrong, that's wrong. You're doing this, you're doing that. With no love involved. It's not building anyone up, is it? Even church discipline, if it gets to that point, the whole purpose and drive of church discipline is motivated by love, or at least it should be. Or you get the brainiacs, don't you? You get the intellectual types. You get the theologians. They, they know every kind of doctrine, back to front, inside out. They're like a, they know their Bible work so well, they're like a walking concordance. They read Graham, uh, Wayne Grudem's systematic theology every time before they get to sleep at night, you know, these kind of people. They, they ace Bible quizzes. And they've got an abundance of knowledge, but somewhere over the years they seem to have missed this really basic fact, this basic point that when they dispense their knowledge, they're to do it in love. Otherwise it's invalid. Don't listen to them. You get people who they've got so much faith it seems they, they can possibly move mountains, Paul says. There's no love involved. They're as good as nothing. Useless. But I say Paul writes, if I give up the way all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, to about my than really here, that's what he's on about. If I give away all I have, but my body to be burned, I gain nothing. Waste of time. Now, love is not the only motivation for those two actions. It might, might just be really stupid and frivolous with what you've got with your money or your possessions. Shh, yeah, I don't, you, I don't, don't mean to say you love them. Even your life. You give away your life and not be motivated by love. You could just be suicidal. Homicidal, actually, if you're part of a twisted ideology that urges you to strap on a, a bomb vest thing. That's, uh, that's murder. It's not love. Paul says, you give away everything you have, even your very life. Not motivated by love, you will gain no thing, nothing. And then, verses four to seven, Paul he reels off a list of the characteristics of what love looks like, doesn't he? But when I first started putting this sermon together, I thought, "Well, it's getting to Christmas, you know, I'll do a, something on love." But this passage is not as light and fluffy and lovey dovey as you might at first think. This list that's coming next, these characteristics of love, um, they're very often they're, they're read out at weddings, aren't they? You might have heard it, you might have been to a wedding yourself. And this, this bit of the Bible is very often read out. And uh, very often, probably to people who have never read the Bible themselves, or very little of it, and we have very limited understanding of it, what it actually says. I wonder that. If they realised, in its context, this uh, list, this passage of scriptures, is actually extracted from a letter which is really a, a harsh rebuke to a bunch of people whose conduct and understanding was less than commendable, actually. What if they realised that and they still pick it? It can be used in that way, isn't it? of course it is. I just, I just wonder if they really knew where it was coming from, what his aim was, they'd still have it. 
And also, this uh, list of characteristics acts like a kind of ultraviolet light. I really should pay more attention. I've got a brother and sister in law, they, they, they're in egg production, they've got a big chicken farm. And um, I think I'm right in saying that all the eggs that come along they have to go under like an ultraviolet light. And the idea is this light highlights all the flaws and the cracks in the shelves, and they just read out all the rubbishy ones and put them aside, and then all the good ones go to Tesco's. Or when I first, my, first, my very first job I ever had was working in a spa shop in Ipswich in, in, on Woodbridge Road and, uh, when I was 16. So it was back in 92, 93. Back in those days, obviously, it was a bit more cash. There weren't no chip and pin or apple pie or beep, off you go. Everything was a bit more cash then, you know, a lot more notes. And my boss, he was a big Italian fella. He didn't want to upset him really, he had a bit of a temper. And he really got cross if someone took a fake 50 pound note. They always rose suspicion. So by the two, we'd have this ultraviolet light thing. He'd shine the, we'd hold the paper underneath and uh, shine this light on it and it'll pick out all the flaws. So I've got little watermarks and things, see if the money was fake. We need this list of characteristics to show on us and its job is to expose our flaws and our cracks. That's what it's for. So let's do that then as we go through this, this list of what love actually looks like. First of all, Love is patient and kind. Is that you 100% of the time? Because to be honest, I've fallen at the first hurdle, if I'm honest with you. Sometimes I can be very impatient, and I have been exceptionally unkind. Well, I think some of the things I've done breaks my heart, let alone God's, to be honest with you. What about you? Love does not envy or boast. You've never been envious of anything, ever? Or have you ever strutted around like a peacock with your chest out, proud and with the things that you have already got and have achieved? Is that you? Love's not arrogant or rude. Ever felt superior to anyone, ever? Maybe you've got a lot of money. Maybe you're a millionaire. Maybe you've got a good job. Maybe you've, you've been really well educated. You've got degrees and doctorates coming out of your lives. That might you feel superior to others who haven't got what you've got. You're at a dinner party. Someone's not of your social standing. You've been, you've been on that. Ever been? Ever been rude to those people? Christmas shopping's, a, you know, we're allowed back in the shops now, aren't we? All that's going on. I went and experienced it uh, the other day. People, people be flocking to Norwich and Ipswich and wherever else. What about the people in the shop doorway? The so called down and outs. Are you above them? Do you walk by and there's a bit of you thinking, if I give them any money, they're just going to spend on drugs and beer or whatever. Probably their own fault they're in that situation. Get like that. Are you above them? Love does not insist on its own way. Are you someone who always puts others first before yourself, even when it costs you? Greatly, 100% of the time, you do that always. You're in the shop, last toy which your little Johnny really needs and wants. And last one, there's two there at the counter. You step aside, let me learn it. Love is not irritable. Now, some people have a real short fuse, don't they? Some people, they're like walking hand grenades. Some people, they, they can pick a fight in a phone box. If there's no one else around, they'd pick an argument with themselves. You get these kind of people, don't you? 
I've been like that before. So have you. You ever been like that? You ever been short-tempered? My kids, over the years, they've, they've learned to give me a wide berth. My kids socially distance from me when they know I've come up a night shift. How about you? You ever been like that? You ever been a bit of a hothead? Lost your temper? Love is not resentful. It's not resentful. Similarly, only someone who holds a grudge, even quietly. Someone might have done you some wrong years ago. You still hold on to that? As it continues to twist you and bitter you? You find it hard to forgive someone for the wrong you. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. And wrongdoing can take many forms, can't it? You may not be a murderer or a rapist, you don't need for that. What about something perhaps supposedly not so hard? Gossip, perhaps. The rumour mill. They have gossip. Do you like to get involved in the gossip? Do you like to hear the latest gossip and then you just can't like to pass that on? Give them little regard or even care as to how much such a thing wrecks a person's life and their reputation and can wreak havoc in the church. You've been guilty of that? Even if there's some truth in that rumour that's going around in the gossip, that's not the kind of truth that we as Christians are to rejoice in. As Christians, we are to rejoice in the truth of God's word primarily and to defend it against attack in this modern day. The church is under enough attack from the outside, doesn't need your help on the inside, spreading rumours. As Christians, we're also not to be liars or cheats for selfish gain. Yes, that means giving to Caesars, what is Caesars, or in our case, giving every penny that we rightfully owe to the tax man, and to be thankful of it. To be thankful to God that he's placed over us a system and a government that looks after us. And all this that we've just gone through, and it's not rocket science, is it? It's not. You don't need a doctorate in theology to get your head around this. You don't even need a rotten trying to basic GCE to to begin to understand this. It's not hard. But how often do we trip up over it? How often do we get it wrong? I fall down on all of that. What about you? Verse 7, Paul writes, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. These virtues referring actually rather to interpersonal relationships with each other rather than our own response and relationship to God. Someone's hard work, irritating, do you bear with them? Do somebody bears with people? Are you someone who believes in the best of people, give them the benefit of the doubt? You're in a crowded room, someone stands on your foot. Your first reaction when they apologise outside of an accident is that, yeah, well done, my foot that was. You like that? Would you give them the benefit of the doubt? Believe in the best in people. Uh, we're not called to be gullible and naive, don't get me wrong. Give discernment, please do. It's a good thing to give someone the benefit of the doubt, isn't it? Surely. Do you hope for the best for people? Genuinely. Even if it means they get a bit above you in the social pecking order. Do you suffer long with people? Even if someone's putting you down, doing you something wrong, do you suffer long with people? And we're not called to be punch bags, don't get me wrong. There is a requirement for justice and self defence, okay. Some niggling, 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 do you suffer long with them? Hoping for the best for them. 
someone is happy, patient to give first, second, third chances before we go off on hand and hate. This is what we're called to be like. Because who loves like this? Who loves like this? Christ loves like this. Christ is long suffering with me, I can tell you. He's really patient with me, ain't you? Jesus perfectly ticks every box here where we consistently fail. And we can't just say, oh well, we're only human and shrug it off. That's not an excuse. This is the benchmark that we must strive for every day and put effort into doing so. This is godly love. What we said earlier on in the, talking to the kids, the ancient Greek word for this kind of love is agape, agape love. It's a sacrificial kind of love. A love that trumps every other kind of love. A love that is perfectly modelled by God himself and is derived from him. A love that we can only desire and imitate as enabled by the Holy Spirit. A love which, verse 8 informs us, will never end. Paul goes on to write that prophecies, tongues, knowledge, they're going to pass away. In verse 9, he writes, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Meaning, we can't quite fully see the full picture yet. So to speak. And his reasoning is in verse 10. He says, But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Referring to the time when Christ is going to come again. Then our imperfect, clouded ways of seeing and knowing will be lifted. We will know in clarity, in seeing clarity. That's going to be a wonderful time. Verse 11. Paul writes, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Many people will point to what it says in Mark 10, verses 13 to 16. It's the bit where the children are coming to Jesus. And I think it's the apostles who oh, shoot, shoot, go away. Because kids weren't thought very much of in those days. There's very much a culture of kids should be seen, if that. And certainly not heard. Kids have come to Jesus and people like that regard it. And Jesus said, No, no, let, let, let the kids come to me. And he says, um, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. And people point to that bit of scripture there as a way of an excuse for their own script, uh, scriptural influence. They're happy to leave all the hard theology stuff to the other people who they perceive as being gifted in understanding and, and, and they'll just, and they're happy for them to explain that to these people. So I think in that passage there in Mark, that's okaying them to have a childlike faith. Not really understanding what childlike faith means. There is truth in that. It's good to have a childlike faith in as much as we are to be childlike in our acceptance of God and what he says in his word. But we are not to be childish of our understanding of what that word says. There's a difference. This means we're obligated to obey what Paul writes elsewhere in Romans 12 too, where he writes, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The expectation there is to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. We are not to remain like little kids in our understanding. We are to move on to maturity. They forget what it says here in verse 11, where he says at the end, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. We're to progress, to mature. We're not to remain childlike in our knowledge. Do you want that? Because if you're a Christian, you really should. You know, Paul felt compelled to write 1 Corinthians, a letter of rebuke to a bunch of people who had childish understanding, which then led to childish behaviour. 
We don't do like that. There's no excuse for them then. There's no excuse for us now. The expectation is to grow in our love and our understanding of God and, and grow in our love for each other. That's, that's not... This isn't a helpful tip or a, a bolt on extra, a helpful suggestion from Paul. This is an instruction that we're supposed to get on with. And it takes effort. And that's what Scripture is for, is to help us to do just that. And able to find the Holy Spirit, of course. How are you getting on? Verse 12, Paul reiterates what he wrote in verse 9 with the analogy of looking in the mirror dimly. And obviously in, in Paul's day, they couldn't pop down to Ikea or Glasswells and get a lovely mirror that we're used to enjoying, seeing our lovely reflection there. That's to make do with what they got in Paul's day. And they used to get metal, like bronze, and they used to polish it and polish it and polish it until they used to see their reflection. But still that reflection would be dim compared to what we're used to now. Looking in the mirror again. And uh, where it says face to face, that's referring to where we can obviously see Christ face to face. That is coming that time. He writes, Then I will, shall know fully the earth, even as I am fully known. Meaning that that veil, that clouds are our seeing and unknown, will finally be lifted. Then we will know in perfect clarity, see in perfect clarity, in the age to come, when we'll be with him. And in the age to come, do you ever think about this? Some, in the age to come, when we're in heaven, some of our gifts will cease and no longer be needed. You think about that? Things like prophecy, what the prophets in heaven will know in perfect clarity. Gifts of healing. Who's going to need to be healed in heaven? No one. In this past year, we've all learned the importance of the NHS, haven't we? The wonderful doctors and nurses and all the rest of them. And they're all heroes, every single one of them. And we realise the importance, how we need them now. But their jobs are only temporary. When I'm in heaven, I'm not going to need to be registered to my local GP. I'll have perfect health forever. Insurance firms. What do we insure ourselves against? Things going wrong. There'll be no insurance salesman in heaven. Well, that's a gift, but it's all going. Verse 13, Paul finishes. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. A love which never ends. This all consuming, sacrificial, agape love emanating from, given by, and reserved for God alone. Do you know it? Have you experienced it? Do you want to? If so, then why not call out to him right now and experience the blessing of his agape love, the sacrificial love that comes from God, the love of God, God who is love himself. Compelled him, his love compelled him, give up his throne in heaven, step into this sin wrecked world, which is our own doing, and live a perfect life, die a perfect death on the cross so that we don't have to. You want to know what agape love looks like? Perfect love, look to the cross, Jesus on the cross. That's the picture of perfect love right there. Jesus on the cross, fully paying the price of our sin. So that we can be restored back to a relationship with Him. Do you have that? Do you want it? I pray that we'll all fully know this indescribable blessing. And as we go on, I pray that we will delve deeper in our love and understanding of God, which is our expectation, and our love for each other, which is also our expectation. Enjoy this God-given agape love, which will never end. Amen.
Father, thank you that you love us so perfectly well. Thank you that you love us so much, you gave us your one and only son. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. And at this time of year, we're now coming into this season where we think of you coming, Lord. Help us remember that you actually came to die because of your love for us. Thank you that um, you're calling your people to you. You're building your church. Help us to uh, honour you, Lord, in the way that we love each other and you. You tell us that by this the world will know that we're yours for our love for each other. Lord, I pray that love will increase. Help us to desire our giftings and to use our giftings, increase our giftings to bless each other up, Lord, to bless each other up and to build each other up in the church in a way which honours you. And thank you that as the time is coming is where we will be with you forever and ever. Praise you, Lord, for that. A wonderful promise that lies in front of us, that we're safe in your hands. Call us home, and it's going to be beautiful. Praise you, Amen.